indigenous people of British Columbia are not on trial. British justice is on trial. British justice. And we are prepared to go to the Hague, the court, the world over, if the government doesn't settle them. It's essentially that's what we said. You can see, even without the sound, a very passionate issue for Who is that? Frank Calder. This is Paul Tennant. He's a political scientist for I'm sorry about that. So, in British Columbia, I've already kind of sketched out that it's played out a little differently in the province. Uh, in 1866, the province, uh, sorry, the two colonies of British Columbia and Vancouver Island were amalgamated into one, and later, of course, entered the Federation of British Columbia. The very first act colonial legislature in March uh, 1866 was an ordinance uh, further to define the law regulating acquisition of land in British Columbia. And what this did was it explicitly prohibited indigenous people from preempting land or homestead. So <clears throat> this is an actual wording from the ordinance, the rights conferred on British subjects or aliens in preempting the Crown lands of British Columbia shall not extend to any of the aborigines of this colony or the territories neighboring there too. So even from this you can see that even people who from outside the country, from aliens, from Europeans, who had this right to most of them, would not be indigenous people of the territory. And here we have a indigenous uh, leaders meeting with the governor at the time, Governor Seymour, to discuss the land issue uh, the year before uh, this ordinance. So indigenous people were already uh, advocating for their rights with respect to the land, uh, even before this was passed. This is where I live in New Westminster. It doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> but, uh, you can see that the Scalo uh, Nation, this is the people that I work with in my work, uh, were gathered in, in the city in the 1860s. To pressure the governor to address the land issue. So it must have been ironic for indigenous people of the day uh, to see someone arrive from Liverpool or Rotterdam or somewhere in Europe or come up from California in order to pan gold. And these folks had no trouble settling on a homestead of prime farmland on the Fraser River. But if you've lived in this area since time immemorial, you are now stripped of this right to homestead on your ancestral lands. And to make matters worse, shortly after this ordinance was passed, uh, Joseph Trutch, who was BC's chief commissioner of land and works, reduced the modest reserve allocations of former governor, uh, governor James Douglas by 90%. So it was kind of a double whammy. Massive reductions of reserves at the same time being stripped of the right to homestead. James Douglas was, I don't know if you learned from him, but it's Talk. He was quite progressive. He was actually married to uh, an Aboriginal woman that was part black. I mean, he had very enlightened views on the issue of race, and he didn't regard indigenous people as equals. Um, so after the gold rush, there was a gold rush in the Fraser Valley uh, and in the Caribou region. After the gold rush began uh, dwindling in 1866, some prospectors departed, but many more stayed to the homestead. So with the gold rush, we had like thousands of people coming into British Columbia, which had a very small settler population, and uh, many from California, and uh, uh, quite a few of them stayed to homestead after. So there was quite a bit of uh, tension around that issues following the gold rush. So what what was the settlers media of the day? And I say the settlers media because clearly these publications were written by uh, settlers, for settlers, and didn't include, uh, didn't, didn't include indigenous people as part of their audience. These newspapers uh, strongly advocated to the government that these people be prohibited from, these people being indigenous people be prohibited from homestead. Here's a couple of excerpts from the British Columbia, which was published in the Westminster. 1862. So this is kind of just the lead up to the passage of this ordinance. Can Indians avail themselves of our preemption law? Are they eligible to preempt 
hold that as British subjects. This inquiry is rendered all the more pertinent at the present time for the fact that a number of Indians have actually preempted allotments. Second, uh, to allow these people all the privileges of others in this respect would be to throw the whole colony into confusion. Just imagine our 80,000 Indians, according to the governor's record, being allowed to locate on land wherever they please. Now, just to kind of appreciate this uh, in the context of local understand or, sorry, of, uh, of understandings of uh, the hierarchies of civilization that existed at the time. Here you see, this is from the sort of mid-19th century, this is put together by the uh, official historian, this is all nation, George Carlson. Um, but you see there's a hierarchy of Europeans at the top. Within that, of course, there's a mini hierarchy of the south of the British at the top, the Portuguese at the bottom, and that Asian people in that North and South America. So I think it's, it's helpful to understand this was, this was generally the thinking of, of many people at the time uh, about uh, the game. So it's reflected in the news coverage that <coughs> So when you read an editorial or I think you use the quote, there's usually a you know, problem identified that's some kind of restriction or solution. Well, back in the day, in the 1860s, there, there really wasn't a distinction between sort of hard news and op-eds. They were all op-eds. So, you know, the writers were always rejecting their, their views and, and putting out prescriptions for problems. So, the prescription in the 1860s was to treat indigenous people differently than settlers, assign, uh, assign them less rights, uh, force them onto smaller and smaller reserves, and uh, legislate mandatory attendance of children in residential schools designed to remake them after the European image. Whereas today, the prescription that comes through is to strip indigenous people on uh, special rights and essentially treat everyone the same. Uh, and it almost inevitably involves this kind of discourse and an amnesia about this country's legacy of colonialism. Uh, and it also ignores the crown's legal obligation to get our British Columbia to deal with the land issue. And indigenous self governance initiatives are, are conceived of as a threat. I guess provincial models are not known for their modesty, but this really uh, takes the king. Uh, British Columbia, Gordon Campbell in 2009 unveiled our new model at the time, best place on earth. So the question, I guess in this one, it's the cartoonist was uh, alluding to the fact that we had the highest child poverty rate of any province in Canada. Mm -hmm. Here, the figures trotting on this little the best place on earth. So I guess the question is, for whom? Uh, two years later, the province changed the model to splendor without diminishment. In any event, the question about whose earth BC is located is still unresolved. So, even compared to other parts of Canada, uh, our province has a history of neglecting the issue of Aboriginal title to the land, reneging on its historical responsibilities to Indigenous peoples and denying uh, Indigenous people's rights. Again, we see the uh, full headdress and planes uh, of the gates of fear uh, of people are being constructed as undemocratic. Certainly, the image of the uh, native warriors is very strong. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal People identified this as one of the three prominent stereotypes of Aboriginal people. It's still very strong today. This was uh, coverage of the uh, BC uh, Treaty Referendum. Referendum on the treaty process that Gordon Campbell held in a lot of protests. Is this the fire? Or I can't They're see burning it. your ballots. Yes, yeah, so there, uh -huh. there was a major uh, kind of movement involving uh, not just indigenous people, but a variety of uh, mm -hmm. organizations, what happens here, organizations, human rights organizations, unions, seniors organizations, uh, to send the ballots into one central location and they would have a center warning. Uh, the bandana wearing warrior also uh, has a lot of resonance. And political cartoons. So here <clears throat> you have a, what I would describe as an immediate construction of indigenous greed and opportunism. So the sense is that through treaty processes, land claims indigenous people are, are just simply uh, being 
being opportunistic and taking advantage of uh, special entitlements. And this is a cartoon about a Nishka chief that depicts three grinning Nishka slobbering as the province is carved up for them by the then premier, Glenn um, Clark, was president. And again, the feather headdresses, and also, in this case, more <coughs> So that's from the Victorian Times columns, just before the treaty was set aside. One of the things you also see is a lot of inflation of the daddy, often to that kind of image of the plain tinny with the headdress. So in this case, this was at a time when <coughs> Vancouver was uh, in the running for uh, 2010 Olympics. And, um, so you have the headline, Natives Go to Europe to Block Our so first of all, which natives? The fact is, only a minority of the First Nations, and you got to remember, British Columbia has more linguistic diversity than Western Europe. A lot of distinct First Nations who take very distinct and different positions on fundamental issues. So in this case, only a minority of uh, Indigenous people were protesting in Olympics. In fact, most local First Nations were active partners in the Olympics. They were very pro-business, very pro-development, and yet that's not how they were portrayed. And then there were some First Nations who were kind of indifferent. Their position was, well, if you want to go have your own exploit. And yet here, just everything is conflated into natives. It'd be a little bit like, in, uh, I guess, in the field of these people, if France and Germany did something, then you can make the generalizations and be in headlines about Europeans do this or that. It's kind of, that's correct. Right. And then very binary coverage, you know, a destruction of us versus that which comes across. And they, our own. Clearly, that doesn't include the way that the headlines constructed. It doesn't include the vision. Quite ironic in British Columbia when you have one person who holds more than half the commercial fishing licenses. The indigenous people will be constructed as sort of enemies of the environment and have, as having a major the uh, salmon industry. And yes, indigenous people do have a special right to fish, but it's for only for food and ceremonial purposes. Jimmy Patterson owns more than half the commercial fishing licenses in the province. And he's not being asked to use it only for you know, to feed his family and for drug big parties. <laughs> but this is this is a this is a very strong image that comes across in coverage coverage of BC uh, fisheries. Here you have the use of uh, the chief whipping up natives over the Indian and clams. Again, this use of the word whips plays into an old stereotype of indigenous people being sort of Constitutional, innately warlike and, and emotionally uh, volatile. Globe and Mail, again. This is uh, this is not British Army, but uh, <coughs> the forces terror man. This is the Canadian Armed Forces terror man. This is the natives. He has a lot. <coughs> so again, this this plays into stereotypes of indigenous people being uh, threatening. Physical security and also the danger of the economy. Now, no question the fact that the Canadian Army included uh, Indigenous people in its counterinsurgency manual, that's new, no question about it. But a front page headline, which a national newspaper prints natives with Hezbollah, not necessarily forces uh, the stereotypes of Indigenous people as threatening and dangerous. Of course, headlines have a lot of power. A lot of people don't read anything more than the headline they Thing that people tend to do research in psychology on is, is, is the, one of the features that people tend to recall later on when uh, defining, defining issues. This is from the local newspaper uh, in Lewis Mister. Uh, here, to the more inclusion of diversity, you have the uh, Coast Salish cedar hat. So it's not just the plains green headdress. There's, there's, so maybe that's a, maybe that's a positive sign. So this brings uh, me to the conclusions. So what I find in contemporary news reporting, not just in this study, but in some of the other ones that I've done, is that there's a real focus on the extreme social conditions experienced by indigenous peoples. But there's a, generally an avoidance of analyzing the actual social and political context of those living conditions, and also the impact of our population. And uh, you know, in British Columbia, 
that history is linked to the issue of the land. The land issue has not been dealt with, even, even compared to how it's been dealt with for the rest of the country. It just has not been dealt with at all. Uh, and that's a big part of it. So by hinging the present on past and its coverage of these issues, the news media perpetuate damaging stereotypes and continue contributing to maintaining inequality between indigenous people. references if anyone wants it. I'm going to send you the PowerPoint. Uh, Who is this guy, Adi? <laughs> that's, uh, you don't have to answer that. That's, uh, yeah. So that, well, that, that, yeah, that paper in 2006, that's the historical part is from that paper, so, yeah. Um, and then there's some really good resources. There's, uh, the uh, Journals for Human Rights do, do uh, work internationally on looking at uh, the role that journalism plays in, in the lives of impoverished peoples and indigenous peoples. And they did a really great study of, uh, of uh, coverage of African issues in this province, and that's available, of course, with the online. And real Indian, uh, if you go to the CBC's website, you can actually play this. Uh, it's a great documentary that looks more than just in Canada, it looks at anyway. it. Like so on and you know, sort of popular media portrayals of indigenous people and, and how and how they've evolved over time. So those are two great resources. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for listening. I realize I'm probably coming from a different place than most of the people in the room, and, and I really appreciate uh, just being given the opportunity to talk and, and I appreciate your patience.